Good morning. This is Steve. And um, it's another beautiful day down here in southern Illinois. Sorry for you folks in Louisiana. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll send a little bit of your humidity and rain up here for us shortly. But, um, this week's uh, talk is a continuation of last week's exploration of Ripple Rock. Remember, Ripple Rock was a dangerous hazard to shipping in the inside passage of the Pacific Northwest that was demolished in 1958 with the largest planned non-nuclear explosion in the history of the world. Miners spent um, two and a half years digging down 400 feet underneath the ground to get under the seabed, tunnel over, and then come back up into Ripple Rock. But how far up should they come? That was a question. Okay, And uh, to answer that question, okay, they first they tried to use sonar to, to map the mountain, Ripple Rock. I mean, this, this rock comes up uh, over 300 feet off of the seabed. Sea and they tried to use sonar to map it, but the technology they had back then, because of the turbulence in the water and the strong currents, all they were able to get was a hazy outline of the mountain. Uh, not near enough precision and detail for the engineers to calculate how much rock was going to be blown off and therefore how much of a charge would be required. So they asked the miners to do something that sounds irrational. They asked the miners to drill out through the rock until they broke through and the sea was pouring in. Now I don't know about you but if I was those miners, this is not something I would have wanted to do. Okay, when I have when the tunnel is 400 feet underneath the the ground, underneath the seabed, and then I'm up in a shaft and I'm drilling through the rock, and all of a sudden the sea port starts pouring in. Okay, the claustrophobia would just start to make me panic. But that's exactly what these miners did. <clears throat> it was a dangerous, tedious job, but they drilled hole after hole out through the rock until the sea started pouring in. And then with the, the water pouring down on them, ra rapidly rising in the tunnel, often they were up to their knees, sometimes up to their waists in seawater before they could get the, the drill bit out of the hole and put on a special gasket, a, a bolt uh, with a rubber gasket on that they then shoved 30 feet back up the hole and twisted to expand the gasket and stop the flow of water. They did this to map the rock. Only when they had mapped precisely how much rock was, ar was around them and what the contours were could the engineers then calculate the precise charge required to blow up and demolish Ripple Rock. Now, when we're dealing with temptation, let me just switch over to the other side here, okay? When we're dealing with temptation, that's important. Because when we're talking about Ripple Rock in Christian circles, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the things that snag and drag us off course, that make us less than what we want to be, what we should be, what we could be. But what is temptation? When you, when you Google it, you come up with something like this. Temptation is an urge or desire to do something especially something you should not. Or it can re refer to a wrong or forbidden pleasure that's enticing. And that's, when we're languaging temptation, that's what we focus on. It focuses us on our desires, 
on the urges that drive us, the impulses that we have, or we focus on the object of our desire, um, people, things, experiences. And when we battle temptation, that's what we focus on. We focus on controlling or eliminating those urges and those desires or the things that they are focused on. We want to blow up the rock. But is that the only way of thinking of temptation? Today I want to try, I want to provide you with some alternatives. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, when we read about temptation in the Bible, I found some interesting things. In both the Hebrew and Greek, basically only one word in Hebrew and one word in Greek is used to communicate temptation or is translated as temp temptation uh, in the King James Version. And both of those words mean to test to prove. Okay. So the Greek, Hebrew and the Greek, uh, the, the meaning of the word is to test. Now in the Old Testament, interestingly enough, the first time tempt is used, God is tempting man. God is tempting Abraham in the first usage. And all through the Old Testament, either God is tempting man or man is tempting God. God is testing man, or man is testing God. Very different from the way we think of temptation and the definition that we have today. Now, when you go to the New Testament, things change dramatically. It's still the, still the same, the, the verb still has the same meaning to test, but in the New Testament, we start right off with Satan testing, tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Throughout the New Testament, rather than God testing man or man testing God, Satan or evil things are testing man. Now, think back to when you were in school. Did you as a student ever say, oh man, i got to study hard because I've got a temptation coming up? Would that even make sense? Or did a teacher ever stand up in class and say, class, I want you to remember, Monday you've got a temptation scheduled. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And yet, that's the meaning of the tempt, of tempt and temptation in the Bible. So, first perspective, what's a temptation? It's a test. What does that have to do, ur do with urges and, and things that we're not supposed to have? Well, the second perspective also comes from the Bible because you might have thought of it, okay? But Steve, okay, what about the Garden of Eden, okay? If that's not temptation, then what is? You're absolutely right, okay? But think about it. God planted the tree. In the New Testament, the first temptation is Jesus in the wilderness. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And then Satan inserted a lie. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That is, that is described as deception. The word tempt, the Hebrew word that is translated tempt or temptation, is not used in that passage at all. Rather, Satan is described as deceiving Eve. And that follows through the Old Testament. Satan is never described as tempting uh, evil things are never described as tempting. Or rather, man is deceived by wealth or riches. Um, Satan deceives. Um, there's, a, there's a passage where, where um, God asks how he's going to get 
somebody to go into a dangerous situation and a spirit stands up, stands up and says, I will go deceive him. Okay. Deception and temptation, are they the same thing? I think there's a close relationship. <clears throat> In the Garden of Eden, Satan inserts a lie. God planted the tree, but then Satan inserts the lie. He tells Eve, Did God really say you can't eat any of the fruit in the garden? And she says, oh, no, no, no. We, we can eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. It's just this tree that we're not supposed to eat. God told us if we eat of it or if we even touch it, we're going to die. And Satan jumped right on that. And he said, in essence, God's lying. You can't die. He doesn't want you to eat it because he knows if you eat it, You'll become like him. To be like God, you have to know good and evil. Deception. Mixing truth with error. And in the New Testament, when Jesus was in the wilderness, uh, Satan said, you think you're God? Prove it. Prove it. What's the lie there? Well, the lie is that our identity is dependent on our ability to perform. Now, in our culture, that lies pretty ubiquitous. Now, how does this translate to my life? Okay. <clears throat> um, I love stories. Maybe that's why I tell them so much, okay? But I love a good story, and by that I mean a story that engages me and stimulates my imagination and draws me into it, okay? Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of story, really. Uh, fantasy, uh, science fiction, anime, it doesn't even have to be in English. As long as I've got subtitles and it's an engaging story, I can watch K-drama or Chinese, it, it doesn't matter, okay? I can do it for days and I will lose myself in the story. And that's the point. I lose myself. I am most vulnerable to this temptation when I'm feeling bored and useless, when my life feels meaningless and empty with the chronic fatigue syndrome that I've been battling for the last 16, 17 years, let me tell you, there are many days where I feel worthless because I can't perform. And so, I am tempted to climb into a story and live vicariously through the heroes and the heroines, through the drama and the adventure and the tragedy. I can do the impossible in a story. I can conquer the unconquerable. I can be significant in the story. But in the process, I forget who I really am. I lose track of my identity and I deny my destiny. And when the story ends and I'm forced to come back into the real world, I'm lessened by the lie that has held me in its grip. Now that's my experience, okay? What I'm saying well, am I saying that stories are evil? Absolutely not. Am I saying entertainment is evil? No. I think stories are powerful communication tools. They help us to experience vicariously, like, like going on a field trip, things that we can never understand otherwise. But if we immerse ourselves in a story, because of a lie, 
the story becomes a tool in the hand of that lie. What I'm suggesting is that temptation doesn't come in the form of things or people or urges or desires. Temptation is the deception that makes those things desirable to us. Anyhow, that's my ripple rock, or one of them. What's yours? It may not be what you thought it was. Map it out for yourself. Is there a lie hidden behind what you desire? Is your identity being challenged and lessened? Next week, I'll unpack another layer of the story. Until then, be safe, friends. Be prudent. But above all, look up. Have a good day.